Just you've heard him speak here a number of times already, and uh, he speaks at a lot of different homeschool groups, and he speaks at the schools and other venues, <coughs> and he speaks at uh, around here at different places as well, different churches. Uh, last Wednesday, he spoke at Lake Stevens, Calvary Chapel, and uh, some of you were there for that as well. And uh, t- tonight, he's going to speak on a different topic. Give the next slide. <coughs> and uh, that's called Dinosaur Bone Wars. You see the... Uh, the highlights mentioned there, and I'm not going to go over that all those points because Patrick will do a bit, much better job. You might wonder what are, what are bone wars all about. That's kind of a strange title, but uh, I think you'll see the importance of that because it it is an example of how we get to where we are to what we are taught in school, and he'll show you some of the problems with that. So, without further ado, Patrick, why don't you come up and uh, share with us. Well, good evening. A couple of things before I get started. Um, We have a uh, geology camp we do. Uh, in the summer, and you all are invited. Uh, There's some flyers back there, a little green flyer. Uh, These were packed last summer. It really surprised me. It was the hottest time of the year, and uh, but we had, oh, probably a hundred people at each one of these camps. It was, it was pretty packed, and uh, we, uh, it's right on the Columbia. It's a beautiful spot in the resort, and so once you pick up a flyer on that, we also do our Uh, Yellowstone creation tour from a biblical perspective. You begin to see really how Yellowstone fits within a biblical framework. And that we do every year. Uh, There are flyers available there. This year we're going back to the dinosaur beds in eastern Montana. We have a special relationship with a rancher there. So you don't pay, uh, you don't pay me to dig for me. You, you know, you pay for the trip, but you get to keep what you find. And uh, so, I mean, you're finding all kinds of things. There are Triceratops teeth, we're finding uh, <coughs> tri- uh, Tyrannosaurus stuff. Last year, we had a couple of high school kids from Texas, and you know, they, were, they didn't know they wanted to be there. And uh, they're the ones that found the T-Rex leg bone. So after that, they said, Bob, we're coming back next year. So <laughs> yeah, you have to have a bug that bites you in a special way. And um, so that, and we also add the agate expedition. Montana moss agates are very prized, and uh, you get to search for those too. Petrified wood, lots of petrified wood. And then we look at the, uh, particularly the Hell Creek Formation, which is the uh, formation that was part of the the bone wars that we're going to look at today. And uh, they're still pulling stuff out of there. So uh, we'll, we'll, that's where we go in the summer. Um, also, too, I do have some online classes available. Um, got a flyer back there. It looks like this. Uh, one is uh, Geology and Apologetics. It's a six-part class. I think this is a real need, especially among our youth today. Uh, they're fed a lot of answers, but they're really not taught how to interpret the geology of things. And so it becomes a little intimidating for them. So this is geology and apologetics, and then there's dinosaurs in the Bible, also a six-part class online you can take. And then there's a short little class. um, It's called Taking the Mystery Out of Geology, and looks at like the top 13 uh, things that present the stumbling blocks to most people. So we take a look at that too. So anyway, they're back there on the table. Take a look at those when you go out and grab some. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. How many of you have ever heard of the Bone Wars? We've got a few that have, just a few. Well, I'll tell you, the Bone Wars really set the tone for American paleontology and uh, gave American paleontology a big black eye for a number of years. There's still Europeans don't quite trust what comes out of America for what happened during this time. Uh, also, too, you know, many of the critters that you're familiar with today 
uh, were named back in this period. Some of them that you grew up with have been taken off the rolls because they're no longer considered valid. That all happened during the Bone Wars. And um, so it's, I want you to understand as we go through this, there's gonna be a lot of names and faces and dates and things. I want you to see the big picture as we go through and see how it all fits together. But what you're really looking at here is a war of philosophies. There's a philosophy behind paleontology that uh, because it uses big words and involves a lot of Greek and Latin, it looks authentic and it looks genuine and genuine science, but it's nothing more than a philosophy. And it's a philosophy that's set against the philosophy of the scriptures. And uh, so that's what we want to really see and I think if we can grasp a hold of that, we're less likely to be intimidated, I think, by all the stuff that comes out of paleontology. So let's go ahead and start in on this. The Bone Wars, uh, also known as the Great Dinosaur Rush, 1877 to 1892, roughly in that period of time. And you'll notice the date 1877. Now that was at the height of the Great Sioux War. So these guys are out trampling around area where I grew up in, in the midst of everything else that's happening between the cavalry and the, and, and the Sioux and the Cheyenne. And uh, there are a few of them that didn't come back because of it. But the great dinosaur rush is really two stories involved with it. Is one is how a few, just a few men, shaped American paleontology and also a study in the nature of man. If you want to get a good glimpse of human nature, this is a great period of history to study. It's just all laid out there in front of God and everybody. So let's set the stage for the Bone Wars. This picture you see here is actually of an expedition uh, with uh, some of Marsh's teams, one of the dinosaur hunters take wagons out there and fill them up with bones and ship them back on the, of course, the newly developing railroads that were happening quite quickly after the Civil War. So railroads would oftentimes go out to a lot of these places and um, dump them off and they'd romp up into the hills and that's where they'd begin to look. So uh, let's set the stage here. Paleontology, the word paleontology means ancient life or paleo means ancient life and logi is the study of, so it's the study of ancient life. Now, here's a good scientific definition of paleontology, one that you'd read out of the textbook. It is the scientific study of life that existed prior to, and sometimes including the start of the Holocene epoch, roughly 11,700 years before the present. See how intimidating that is if you don't know what those words mean? <laughs> it includes the study of fossils, and here's the purpose behind paleontology. It's not just because you're interested in fossils. You must buy in to the philosophy behind it. It's uh, to determine an organism's evolution and interactions with each other and their environments, or their paleoecology. So it is, um, it's very, very evolutionary. And typically the, w the gateway into um, paleontology is to get your undergraduate, your undergraduate degree in some uh, section of geology, and then you can go on into paleontology. But by then you're pretty much of a, a disciple and uh, you're not up really for questioning it. There are very few who can survive it. Um, uh, very few. Here are some of the assumptions that paleontology makes. First of all, paleontology assumes the evolution of life from a common ancestor. It just assumes that. It's never proven it. It's assumed it. And uh, they assume that fossils definitively document the history of ancient life. That's an assumption. Another assumption is that everything got here through naturalistic means and can be explained naturalistically. That's an assumption. That's not science. It is an assumption. Uh, further, they assume deep time. This is a common expression in uh, geology and paleontology, the subject of deep time. But really what they're saying is that it gets so far back there that you lose track 
and you just stop thinking about it. I mean, you and I can think, okay, we, we talk about the pharaohs, and we get back to, you know, a few thousand years, maybe 4,000 years, and uh, we're back to the time of Abraham and so on, and okay, yeah, that, that's, that's, I can grasp that. But who can grasp 5 million years, 50 million years, 100 million years? It, nobody can grasp those enormous numbers. And uh, so it's called deep time, and it's just kind of like, it just disappears after, the, after a while. I think this is one of the reasons why it has so infected our culture. Because people can't think about it. They just kind of take the expert's word for it. Things are very, very old, they say. But millions of years, my goodness. That is, uh, I, I try to sit down and comprehend that. Think about the number of maybe geological events that have happened in your lifetime. And then start multiplying that by uh, 10,000 years, by 100,000 years, by a million, by 50 million. You just run out of steam after a while. I mean, it's just an amazing amount of time. Ancient environments and ecologies, this is what it assumes. When they look at a series of rock layers, <clears throat> the paleontologist assumes that what he's looking at are ancient environments within the rocks. What you and I do as flood, believers in the flood, we don't look at, at it as an ancient environment. We look at it as an event that was preserved in the rocks. Do you see the difference? It's a huge difference. And, uh, of course, very, very quick, uh, quickly laid down and preserved, too, according to the flood. They also assume that the Christian scriptures are ancient myths that have no relevance in science. So these are all assumptions, and it's expected that you come into paleontology already convinced of these assumptions. Um, I remember working with a, a, a geology student several years ago. She was from Utah went through the geology program there at the University of Utah, and uh, she said after she came out, she was so torn up, and uh, they just, they ridiculed her, they made fun of her because of her belief uh, in a young earth and a global flood. She almost didn't survive it emotionally even. So they, I mean, they, they attack. It's not dealt with on a scientific basis. It's it's their philosophy, and it's right against yours, and yours is wrong. That's an assumption. Now, <clears throat> it's clear that a straightforward reading of the Scripture teaches a young earth and a global flood. I don't know anybody that can sit down and read the Scripture at face value and come up with any other meaning. It is just not possible. You've got to twist and turn and and fiddle around with the scriptures if you're going to get any other meaning. And geologists know this, by the way. In fact, they ridicule people who claim to be Christians and don't have uh, an idea of what the scriptures say. Some of these guys know the scriptures better than you and I do. It's really amazing. And they definitely know their history of earth better than we know ours. I've run into a lot of Christians who can't tell you in what chapters the flood is covered. They, they can't tell you uh, what it really says. I heard the story when I was growing up, but I would mock Noah and his little boat. He carried all of these, supposedly carried all of these animals and things. Well, I didn't ever read the story. Uh, we had a Bible on our TV. I'm not sure why it rested on the TV, but <laughs> there it was. And, uh, you know, it was as beautiful the day I saw it as a kid as when I left home. It just was never read. And uh, so it's, it's something we have to take a look at. How well do we know our history and uh, the Scripture? Anyway, it is very clear that there are two different presentations of earth history out there. One <clears throat> is through the story of evolution, the other one's through the story of the scriptures. Many people have tried to harmonize these. It's impossible. You cannot harmonize it, not without compromising one or the other. And uh, it's, it's clear that these are two different presentations of history 
that uh, tell different, radically different stories. So the, I think one of the first things we have to realize is that Earth history is not a story that can be told by science. Did you realize that? Science can't tell. It's impossible for science to tell the story, and here's why. Science deals with things that can be observed, tested, and repeated. Most of secular Earth history has never been tested, observed, and repeated. We can watch erosion happening today, but not on the scale that we see in the fossil record. And so science really should be silence when it comes or silent when it comes to a presentation of Earth history. But it is the interpretation of the same things that you and I look at. That's what carries the day. In order to construct an Earth history, you must rely on one of two things, an interpretation based on a worldview or recorded historical testimony. Is that what we do with the Civil War? I don't know anybody who's alive from the Civil War anymore. <laughs> Unless it's some of you guys out there. <laughs> uh, but what we do have are books written by people who did see it. And so we can establish the Civil War, most of it as a historical event, because it has recorded historical testimony and eyewitnesses. Well, what about Earth history in deep time is, has any kind of eyewitnesses? There are none. And there's no recorded history. Now, geologists will tell you, well, the rock layers, they, you know, we're, we read the rocks. No, you don't. You look at them and you interpret them. But you certainly don't read them. There are no words there in the rocks. There are no dates stamped on the rocks of the fossils. You have to interpret them. And to get a secular geologist to admit that they have an interpretation, a worldview, is like pulling teeth. I mean, it's just they won't do it because, of course, science doesn't deal with worldviews, uh, so they say. So the beginning of all of this and really the quest for searching of dinosaur bones and trying to study these great creatures really came from this guy, James Hutton, called the father of modern geology. Very few people know that James Hutton was also one of the fathers of the Scottish Enlightenment which means that he had some definite beliefs about Scripture, about the God of the Bible, and about church. And he rejected it all. And uh, in 1795, his famous book, Theory of the Earth, you could summarize it this way. The world was not created in seven days, and the world was not 6,000 years old as calculated by the genealogies of Genesis. Well, what does that remind you of? <clears throat> Whenever I read Genesis 3, and Eve tells <coughs> the serpent, if we eat the fruit, we're going to die. And what does Satan do? You surely shall not die. Just flat out contradicts what God had told her. And uh, this is what you see here in James Hutton. The earth is not 6,000 years old, and it wasn't created in seven days. It's just repeated. This, this pattern is repeated uh, throughout history. And uh, it, we, it's one of those things we have to watch for. And kids, this is a good one that you can begin to practice even as you start hearing things. Um, ask yourself, wow, does this contradict what the scriptures say? If it does, boy, then you need, to, you need to take a second look. The historical scripture that Jesus not only trusted but fulfilled included a recent creation in a global flood. We can't divorce those from that. He trusted the entire book. <clears throat> he wasn't like Thomas Jefferson who took a scissors to most of the Bible and the part where all the miracles were, Thomas Jefferson cut them out because Jefferson was deistic in his thinking. And of course, in deism, there's no room for miracles. So this is not what Jesus did. He didn't carve up the scriptures. It was a whole book. And uh, so he not only trusted it, but he also fulfilled it. And that book uh, included a recent creation in a global flood. Now, 
This is a very interesting book here, Hunting Dinosaurs. I have this one. It's a fascinating look. And um, a look at dinosaurs and kind of the history. But the author of the book says this. He said, being a paleontologist is like being a coroner, except all the witnesses are dead and all the evidence has been left out in the rain for 65 million years. Well, that's almost an impossible story to reconstruct. If I was a detective, I wouldn't know where to begin. Uh, and that's really what they are. Geologists uh, and paleontologists are really nothing more than detectives. They're trying to put together these pieces, but they're leaving out a lot of the rules. And uh, one of those rules involves considering all witnesses. One of the witnesses is the history of the scripture. It's more than a religious book. It's a history book. Now, <clears throat> here we have a tour going on where there's a dinosaur dig here. And uh, he said, we believe these dinosaurs died playing Twister or perhaps became trapped in the same tar pit over time. But most likely it was Twister. <laughs> well, I love this cartoon because it does highlight something. And paleontologists know this. Paleontology is not exactly an exact discipline. <laughs> it involves a lot of guessing and imagination. If you're going to be a good paleontologist, you have to have a good imagination. Uh, <clears throat> and you've got to be able to talk. Here's one of the reasons. Because most of the bones we find, the rule is disarticulation. Disarticulation means they're torn up, spread around, they're mixed together. You know, we find mammal fossils with dinosaur fossils. We find sea fossils with land fossils. It's just all mixed around. <clears throat> and there's no way to sort it out by science. Very little of it can be solved by science. You might be able to tell what a vertebra is uh, from a fish scale, but that doesn't solve your, your issue, which is how did they originate? How did these creatures originate and how did they get here? How were they buried? Uh, those are mysteries that really can't be solved by science. All we have are petrified bones. And uh, petrification isn't an easy thing to solve. The, it's a, quite a mystery. There have been many people who've tried to duplicate petrification, and it's just never worked because we're recognizing more and more that the massive petrification we find in the fossil record was really done under very unique circumstances. There are some uh, natural petrification things that are going on today. One of them is that, uh, uh, this is not really petrification, but uh, guys, I'm going to help you to get off the hook here with your wives. Every year you have this pressure around Christmas time to do what? You know, to buy your wife a diamond. Well, did, you know, geologists thought they were the oldest substance on earth, so at least four billion years old. But diamonds are produced today uh, through peanut butter. <laughs> sure, they put, peanut butter has a lot of carbon in it. And so they put it under heat and pressure and voila, they get a diamond that you could not tell the difference. So uh, guys, you know, just forget the diamonds, go to some different stones here. <laughs> but uh, coal, the same way, coal can be Pr uh, produced rather quickly under the right conditions. Uh, some of the trees in Yellowstone, you know, as the silica-rich waters of the geysers encroach onto trees, the trees suck up that water, and it begins to petrify the base of the trees. In uh, Yellowstone, you'll see them, these white things, they, they call them bobby socks, those of us who are old enough to remember bobby socks. <laughs> I just, I don't have much explanation. We do our tour, and the kids at Bobby Socks, what are Bobby Socks? You know? But yeah, these white things, they're petrifying. So there is some natural petrification and preservation that does take place, but certainly we've not observed it and can't reproduce it on the scale that we see in the fossil record. Now, paleontology is considered to be an historical science, it seeks to explain all of Earth history, and that's what a historical science is. It seeks to explain all of Earth history in terms of naturalistic assumptions and world view. Some of your historical sciences include cosmology, astronomy, 
astrophysics, geology, paleontology, origin of life and biology, <coughs> and archaeology. <coughs> archaeology, there was a time uh, that uh, archaeology was fairly free uh, from the Enlightenment beliefs and ideals. And, but today, archaeology denies just about everything in the scripture. For a long time, when I was a lot younger, I used to get a book called Biblical Archaeology. I don't know if you've seen that magazine. Beautiful pictures in it. But three-fourths of it denies the scripture. And I, I've, one day, I was just came away, I was depressed. And I thought, why am I reading this thing for? It undermines everything I believe. That's the nature of archaeology today. It takes a very biased view against the Bible. And uh, so it's really not biblical archaeology. One thing that scientists accuse Bible believers of doing is circular reasoning, using the Bible to prove your points by quoting the Bible, you see. Well, it's not quite that simple, but they accuse us of doing it. Well, here's something you ought to know. Secular paleontologists do exactly the same thing. Secular paleontologists hold the key to the interpretation of fossils. How do they do that? They define and set the rules that are used. And then they also determine the meaning of the bones. That is circular reasoning. The paleontologists say this fossil is so many millions of years old. Why? Because they set the rules on how it's going to be interpreted. That is, that's really a rich case of circular reasoning. Paleontology is also dependent on artist renditions that are fired by the imagination of paleontologists who have been influenced by the worldview, uh, their worldview of dinosaurs. Look at these pictures here. Most of these are now how you see theropod dinosaurs illustrated. Um, some time ago, I bought a little a case of toy dinosaurs from Safari. They, they make a lot of these kinds of, you know, natural, nature-type toys. And uh, opened them up, and, you know, the names, you know, Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, and I said, what? They all have hair on them and fur and wings and feathers, and this is what they do. Now, the kids don't know the history of this. They just pick up a dinosaur that looks like a bird. And, of course, that's where the philosophy is today. There's absolutely no science for it. But our kids are getting infected with it. And uh, the, it's all because of imagination. So the word dinosaur, very interesting etymology of this, is, uh, means terrible lizard. It was given that name in 1842 by a brilliant scientist. In fact, he was really a thorn in Darwin's side. Um, he didn't know what to make. I don't see any exposition of scripture involved, but he may have been a believer. He was called the Queen's paleontologist. That would have been Queen Victoria at the time. But a brilliant scientist and uh, was a nemesis of Thomas Huxley and really did a lot of battle there. But he purposely named them Terrible Lizard. Now, he thought that the dinosaur was probably most like the modern monitor lizard. And so he named it Terrible Lizard. A lot of paleontologists rename it today and call it Terrible Reptile. But dinosaur does not mean Terrible Reptile, and, and uh, Owen did not mean it to be so. In fact, if Owen wanted to call them Terrible Reptiles, he would have used a different word, herpeton, a uh, creeping creature. Or another one that shows up a lot in our King James version of the Bible, dracon or dragon. Dracon's a Greek word, serpent, huge land or sea creature. It's all over the Old Testament. And, uh, but he named them terrible lizards. Well, today it might interest you to know that paleontologists are just as confused on the issue as they were 100, 200 years ago. Uh, some paleontologists think that dinosaurs were warm-blooded, others cold-blooded. Some think they were mammals, others reptiles. Some don't know what they were. It's still an unsolved mystery. Uh, and yet books are written, and our kids get the idea that these guys really know what they're talking about. And we have to catch them on this and hold some integrity in the area of science. 
Well, after, of course, Owen came Charles Darwin, and in his book in 1859, he wrote that all living things were descended from a common ancestor, perhaps millions of years ago. And uh, so this started the whole war to try to find uh, missing links. Obviously, if they were all connected, you can see in his handwriting there, if all living things descended from a common ancestor, they all share a relationship in some way. I was talking to a group of kids today. We were talking about the difference between kinds and uh, uh, kinds and varieties. And I asked them, well, what is it called here? You know, horses have vertebrae. Man has, verte uh, uh, has vertebrae. Uh, lots of animals have backbones. So does that mean that we are related? Well, Darwin thought so. But it doesn't. There's another way to look at it. And that is, God found a design for certain creatures, and it works. So we are vertebrates. We don't share a common ancestry. We share a common designer. But they won't look at it this way. And so for kids to grab a hold of that concept, I think will help them in the whole species war. During this time, during Darwin's day, there were only three sets of fossils identified as dinosaurs. Uh, one was the Megalosaurus. You can see how much they found of him. Not much at all. Uh, another one was Iguanodon, and they named it Iguanodon. Had no idea what it looked like. I'll show you in a minute what they, uh, how they modeled them. But the teeth reminded people of the modern Iguanodon. And then the third dinosaur was this one, Haleosaurus, uh, meaning forest lizard. Now, can you make sense out of that one? I think if you know anything about dinosaurs at all, you say, well, I see a spike... And the, the spike is a lot like the ankylosaurus. And, but can you really tell from that wad of bones what that thing is? Well, here's what they thought in the uh, mid-1800s. There's Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and Hylaeosaurus, or forest lizard. So these are the renditions they had. And the public... Uh, I mean, this was in, these are still there in England. They formed part of a park in England that um, uh, kind of like a th the modern theme park. And it drew thousands of people who were hearing about these big beasts. They wanted to see what they look like. Well, they're going home. The kids are telling their parents and grandparents. Uh, people are telling their, their pastors. Pastors don't know what to do about it. There are very few pastors in the 1800s who knew how to handle the onslaught of this kind of stuff. A lot of them caved in their faith. Many of the great commentators, the great expositors of the 1800s all caved in when it came to uh, deep time and a view of Genesis. It's really, um, it's, um, it's very sad, sad church history to see it. One of the guys who was responsible for doing this was this guy here. Uh, his name was Thomas Huxley, um, 1825 to 1895. So he would have been right in the thick of the dinosaur wars that we're going to look at here. He's 55 years old in this picture here. He had a couple of nicknames. One of them was Darwin's bulldog. The other one was the bishop eater. <laughs> he loved to tear apart bishops. You know, he, he made fun of them a lot because very few of them knew their scriptures. Number one, very few of them knew how to defend them. And they sounded like idiots. So he would eat them up and spit them out. And Thomas Huxley was one of the bigger, biggest defenders worldwide of evolution. And uh, it did infect a lot of Europeans. He's the guy who shortly after Darwin came out with his origin uh, book <clears throat> was looking for missing links. Huxley said, you know, essentially, I'll take up the challenge. And so the first missing link that got proposed, 1861, was a fossil that had been found in Germany called Archaeopteryx. And uh, so 
Huxley said, well, he looks a lot like this small dinosaur, Compsognathus. Out there on the table, I have a reproduction of Compsognathus, just a small little dinosaur. And uh, so Huxley's idea was that Compsognathus evolved into Archaeopteryx that gave us modern birds. And everybody went, huh, I guess we're sunk, aren't we? Genesis can't mean what it says. I mean, this really was an onslaught against the church, frankly. But uh, no one stopped to ask Huxley, how old was Compsognathus? Well, in geological ages, he was the same age as Archaeopteryx. <laughs> so I'm sorry, there's no link there. <laughs> he might have been. <laughs> He, he might have been living uh, in the same swampy area, but he certainly wasn't a uh, predecessor. And uh, so the other thing is that those who would know their scripture know this, that in day five, uh, birds were created. And on day six, dinosaurs or land creatures were created. So there really could not be any evolution between land animals and birds. As God said it, birds came first and then land animals. That should have solved the, the issue, but it didn't. And uh, a lot of people in Europe had American students. You know, a lot of American students came over to Europe to escape the Civil War. Uh, and they went to school at some of the real prestigious uh, colleges over there. The professors in Europe were all urging them to go west in the United States. That's really where the dinosaur bones were. You know, you need to get into the unpopulated areas of the American West. And of course, this is where we get into dinosaurs in the American West. This time was called the Gilded Age of America. The whole idea of go west, young man. You know, the Civil War had ended. The railroad was booming. People were settling the area. They were very curious about this area. And it was a very dangerous area, too, because there were uh, thousands and thousands of Native Americans out there. And um, they were having their own problems. And here, the paleontologists then, a few that were here in this country, started to venture out. One of the first guys in this whole um, idea here, the Bone Wars, was this guy named Joseph Lighty. He uh, was the first paleontologist of vertebrates in the United States. And uh, so he had quite a reputation uh, with people. A lot of people studied under him. 1856, he described the first, now notice this is what's in the literature, the first complete dinosaur skeleton found in America, in New Jersey. That was the hadrosaur, the duckbill dinosaur. You see what he found? Up there on the top of the page, that's what he found those bones. Now they describe it though as Lighty uh, discovering and describing the first complete dinosaur. This gives the impression that paleontology, all they have to do is look for the stuff, they find it and uh, reconstruct them and voila, they've got the picture. Very, very few dinosaurs are ever complete. In fact, it's mostly the smaller ones. The most complete Tyrannosaurus is somewhere around 65% complete. And that was not found until Sue Hendrickson found, found him in uh, South Dakota. Lighty was also the first to use a microscope to solve a murder crime. Uh, but here now we come to the other part of the story. He was an ardent supporter of Darwinian evolution. And he was preaching it. Another fellow that was, had known Joseph Lighty and worked with him uh, was actually quite an explorer himself, was Ferdinand Hayden. Does that name ring a bell? Well, Ferdinand Hayden is one who led the expeditions into Yellowstone and brought back the, the prints and the photographs and things. And so in uh, 1872, was it? Yellowstone became a national park, and it was because of Hayden's work. Hayden's the one who uh, laid the groundwork for the, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. And um, he also had kind of a checkered past. He was out, he'd, he'd pick up everything he saw in terms of rocks. You can see him there in the middle of this one expedition there. Um, on the left, you can see he's circled. He's at the head of the table there. On the right is the expedition in Yellowstone. He got separated from the uh, escort 
one time and um, ran into a band of Cheyenne Indians. And the Cheyenne, if you know anything about the history of the Cheyenne, the Cheyenne were pretty ruthless. And the only reason they didn't take his life was because he, he, at the time Hayden was carrying around backpacks full of stuff. They demanded that he dump out his backpacks. And of course, out came a lot of rocks and fossils. And so the Cheyenne thought this guy was crazy. And they, that's why they left him alone. He kind of had a, a kind of a dreadful respect of crazy people. But they named him this, he who runs around picking up stones. <laughs> That was his name, the Cheyenne <laughs> gave to him. Uh, he also died of syphilis. Now, I don't know what they're pretty quiet about that part of his history, but um, syphilis is a nasty, nasty disease. One of Joseph Lighty's students was this guy here, E.D. Cope. And E.D. Cope was one of the guys involved in the dinosaur bone wars. Tremendous amount of energy and put himself uh, at a lot of risk and was out in the parts of Montana where the Blackfeet, the Cheyenne, the Sioux were. And uh, a a few times he and this other fellow named Marsh we're going to introduce were all over the place trying to get, trying to escape a lot of the Indians, but of course this is where the bones were, so this is where he went. Left his wife and of course his children back in in, uh, Philadelphia, and he was out most of the time in the West here looking for looking for stuff. And (laughs) it's not your typical field trip, I can tell you that. That area out there, I don't know if you've ever been into Montana, but um, you know, I mean there are some pretty desolate places. My dad and I used to go out and look for dinosaur bones in a particular area of Montana. And you, you wouldn't see anybody. There was nobody living out there. There were cows, and that was about it. And uh, you could get lost, and no one would ever know you were lost. Uh, it's, it's quite a frontier still today. 700,000 people live in the state, and it's, what, the fourth largest state in the union. <laughs> So this really began the Bone Wars, or the Great Dinosaur Rush. It was also the same time as the Great Sioux War, 1876-1877. And the two primary characters that were involved in this whole thing were E.D. Cope. His name was really Edward Drinker Cope. And I thought, that's kind of an unfortunate name. (laughs) And then Othniel Charles Marsh, and he hated the name Othniel. So uh, it's actually a biblical name. And, but he, he insisted everybody call him O.C. So he was called O.C. Marsh. Very interesting background of these guys. Cope was a Quaker. He had a very strong Quaker background. Uh, but he was a Lamarckian evolutionist. Now, <clears throat> Lamarck believed that you could acquire changes simply by use or, or, or lose them by disuse. So if you wanted to have children that had stronger muscles, you needed to lift weights. That was what Lamarck believed, and uh, Darwin himself believed that for a long, long time. The other guy was Marsh, of course. He came from a family of missionaries, but there is nothing in his life biography at all that tells us that he had any kind of good influence or positive influence. And uh, he was an ardent supporter of Darwinian evolution. In fact, made several trips over to Europe to see Darwin and to see Huxley. He and Huxley were very good friends. And um, Huxley visited Yale University where he had the Peabody Museum uh, a few times. One biographer says the efforts of these two men led to over 142 new species of dinosaurs being discovered and described, though today only 32 are valid. Now, the important point here to see is what happened to the faith of people that saw these discoveries. They were in the newspapers all the time. These guys were heroes. They were bringing back bones, people uh, they never knew existed and discovering these big, big dinosaurs that no one had figured out. Remember, in Europe, there were still only three dinosaurs that had been uh, described. 
And now these guys are bringing these huge bones back from the West and describing these creatures. And uh, no one knew what to do with them. The church was at a loss in how to handle these things. The efforts of these two men um, meant that 75% of the species they named are no longer considered valid today. And that's the bloody, bloody trail that's left from these guys. Here's the territory they roamed through. Here's a map of the, called the Weird West. (laughs) But uh, they did a lot of fossil hunting in northern Kansas, southern Nebraska. A lot of the big major sea finds came out of Kansas. The Mosasaur, the Elasmosaur, the Pteranodon, first discoveries all came out of Kansas. And uh, they found a lot of mammal fossils in Nebraska. Um, here in Colorado, or there in Colorado, uh, near Denver and the area surrounding Denver is really where the dinosaur bone wars started. What, the guy who was pulling these things out near Denver sent some bones to Marsh asking him to take a look and wanted to be hired as a digger. Never heard from Marsh. Marsh just ignored him. And so he got tired of it, and he sent him to Cope and said, I'd, I'd like to be hired as a digger for these things. Cope immediately hired him. And that set the whole bone war off, that Marsh could not stand Cope getting involved here. In fact, Marsh thought he was the owner of all uh, sites out in the West that would be discovered or that had been discovered. And you, so you can see how this set up a, really a, a fierce hatred and rivalry among these guys. Colorado, up there in South Dakota was another place they excavated. Montana, near where I grew up, uh, lots and lots of fossils came out of there. Big, big dinosaurs. In uh, southeastern Wyoming, near Como Bluff, um, a lot of the first big dinosaurs discovered came out of Como Bluff. In Utah, Utah is now a site of uh, active excavations in eastern, central and eastern Utah. In southwestern Wyoming, we still go there today and fossil hunt in the beds that uh, Marsh and Cope both fossil hunted in. In uh, New Mexico, uh, huge discoveries near Santa Fe. And uh, in fact, there's still an active uh, quarry there near Santa Fe. It's called Ghost Ranch, and it's a kind of a retreat now, but it still is an active dinosaur quarry. And then in northwestern Texas, um, if you've ever been to northwestern Texas, it's quite different than the rest of Texas, and that's where they were finding all the bones here. This is Marsh's team of diggers. They were Yale students, and uh, the Yale students all paid their own way. Just they wanted to go out for adventure. And uh, they had to have some experience with a rifle, uh, not to kill the dinosaurs they found, but protect the... One, one, you know, this, like the story in the Bible where they were building the wall and they had one hand on their spear and one hand on the bricks, you know. And this was kind of like this. They had to be always watchful of, of uh, Native Americans. Bill Cody was a scout for Marsh in the 1800s. Cope and Marsh were financially and socially ruined by their attempts to disgrace each other. They took it into the newspapers. And of course, the public loved it. You know, they always, they still do today, don't they? They want to see a good fight. Who cares it gets hurt in the process? Who cares who's right or wrong? It's just a good fight. And uh, they did this. They um, discredited each other. They just literally ruined each other, and they gave American paleontology a black eye. Marsh was actually the first professor of paleontology in America. Well, how did he manage that? Well, he did go to school at Yale, but his father, uh, named Peabody, was a very wealthy man and uh, decided to fund Marsh's vision for establishing a museum at Yale, and that became the Peabody Museum, well, the most famous museum other than one in Philadelphia of the day. He did more than any other American scientist of his day to promote Darwin's evolution in America. In fact, had Marsh kept quiet 
I doubt whether we would have seen the advances in evolution into the early parts of the 1900s uh, that we, uh, if Marsh had not gotten involved. But he was an ardent evolutionist. He's the one who gave us the modern evolutionary tree of the horse. This is what Huxley and Darwin were so excited about. Uh, they said there is nothing else like what Professor Marsh has done in establishing and building the idea of evolution through the evolutionary tree of the horse. And of course, today you find out there's no evolutionary tree at all. Most of the horses that are on the tree all lived at the same time. <laughs> so there are varieties, but no descendants there. Marsh died with $186 in his bank account and 80 tons of fossils that filled five railroad freight cars. Most of them are still packed in their packing material today. You just can't get to them. There are a lot of places like this. Under Utah, University of Utah, underneath their football stadium are pallets, hundreds of pallets of dinosaur bones still wrapped in their castings because no one's had the time to get to them. And it, it's amazing what's, what's still out there. <laughs> he never married, and he, he died of pneumonia. Uh, kind of a sad life, really. He had a horrible upbringing, uh, and, but, uh, and it was a real mystery to a lot of people. Never was close to anybody at all, and it's a kind of a sad, sad life. One of Marsh's, though, biggest mistakes in the bone wars was this critter, Brontosaurus. How many of you grew up with Brontosaurus? Yeah, yeah, he was my favorite dinosaur, he and Triceratops. They didn't make much out of T-Rex in those days, but it was Brontosaurus and Triceratops. Brontosaurus excelsus, or Thunder Lizard the Great. Uh, the diggers for Marsh were out in Como, Wyoming, or Como Bluff, Wyoming, and they discovered a bunch of these big bones. They sent them back, you know, shipped them back uh, by wagon to the nearest railroad depot, and the railroad then, of course, carried them back. But uh, it did not have, and this is the real mystery here, it had no head, and uh, some feet were missing. In fact, Brontosaurus is now called the dinosaur that never was. You have this picture here. Those are the bones that were sent back. So there's some feet missing and a head. And uh, so Marsh wondered, well, let's do this. I think I found a new species of dinosaur, and that's why he called him Brontosaurus excelsus. And uh, so he attached some other sauropod feet, kind of make it complete, and he fashioned a head from a composite parts of another sauropod and mounted it. And uh, that became the first cultural icon of the public. And thanks to, in part, well, in a big part, to Sinclair gasoline. You know, they still have the dinosaur out near their, in their, by their gas station. That's supposed to be Brontosaurus. And uh, <laughs> they did all they could to advance this dinosaur. And of course, that's the one I grew up with, Brontosaurus. And uh, today he's been renamed and the story is kind of kept hush. Even Charles Knight, uh, he's the one that really put dinosaurs on the map in the public. His artwork was just tremendous. And uh, he, was a, he was actually a, a disciple of Cope. He helped cope in a lot of things. But that picture there is the picture I grew up with, with Brontosaurus. This is uh, Knight here. And um, there you see a, a painting of the tar pits, which is another fiasco. But that's the picture that you see when it comes to the tar pits in California. Here's the first book I ever read as a kid, the How and Why Wonder Book of Dinosaurs. Not interesting. And uh, a lot of the pictures in there are Marsh's pictures. Where it really came to a head, though, was in 1989 with the U.S. Postal Service. They issued four stamps, their collection of dinosaurs. They thought they were doing the public a real neat thing here. They, four commemorative stamps. There's T-Rex, there's Pteranodon, Stegosaurus, and Brontosaurus. Now, the paleontologists had long ago abandoned Brontosaurus. The public was still, the stupid public was still believing this story. And so they accused the Postal Service of, of deceiving the public. 
And there was a war that went on between the U.S. Postal Service and a lot of paleontologists. The Postal Service, I think, rightly so, just said, look, you're the guys who originally told us about this stuff. You should have told us <laughs> about the decision to erase him from the, from the halls, you know. But uh, they didn't. And that became a real thorn in the side of the paleontologists and the U.S. Postal Service. Well, here's a picture of Cope. Now, Cope was a, a, a prolific writer. He holds the record for the most scientific papers written in his lifetime, and that is 1,400 papers. Isn't that amazing? I mean, the guy just churned them out. He said he was churning them out at the rate of one or two a day. Uh, he, he, was just, he was just that way. Both he and Marsh were influenced, by the way, by Charles Lyell, Huxley, and Heckel. You know Ernst Heckel? You have that name ring a bell? You know what? People think he's dead. His philosophy is dead today. He's the one that came up with the idea of um, recapitulation, ontogeny, uh, re uh, recapitulates, what is that? Fi <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The idea was that the, um, the embryos displayed in their development displayed their evolutionary history. And, uh, well, it didn't come out until I think the 1990s that these drawings were all fraudulent. Now, Heckel was a brilliant artist. He was a biologist. Um, but he, these were all fabricated. None of them are true, but they had an effect on the public. And now people think it's all dead. You know, I was in Yellowstone last year. I picked up a brand new book there on the uh, cyanobacteria of Yellowstone, some of the latest research. The scientist in there is all in when it comes to Heckel and what he taught. So it is not dead. I mean, it's alive amongst many paleontologists today. Cope lost an entire fortune in mining, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in 21 or 22 mines in the Southwest. All of them went bankrupt. That's a real story. To, a lot of lessons in that one. Uh, and he died of a, a stomach illness that bothered him for, for many, many years. He was out looking for dinosaurs even and ill a lot of the time. And sad story with Cope, too, he was separated from his wife uh, later on in his life. They never did get divorced, but they separated. And so she lived in part of Pennsylvania, and he lived in Philadelphia. And it's just kind of a, kind of a sad, sad story. Uh, he's most remembered, especially, and thanks to Marsh, for attaching a fossil head at the wrong end. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he had it displayed. He wrote, he, in fact, he found it. And uh, when he attached the head, he attached it where the tail should have gone. And Marsh pointed this out and then started publishing. And Cope tried to get all of the magazines, buy up all the magazines, but he, he couldn't do it. And so that became, became a real uh, problem for him. Now, Cope also uh, discipled this guy, Henry Fairfield Osborne. Osborne did some digging for him. He was president of the American Museum of Natural History for 25 years. He had a real influence on paleontology in America. Here he is seen as Times Man of the Year in 1928. He was uh, um, a, um, a eugenist. He believed that we should eliminate the weaker races. And uh, so he was one of those early guys that advocated sterilization and finding the weaker people in our culture and making, it, making them unfit to bear children. This is where he was at. He was a staunch evolutionist. One of his books here, um, this is his biography here, Brian uh, Regal, Henry Fairfield Osborne, Race and the Search for the Origin of Man. He was very much into it. At any rate, in 1917, there was a tooth that was found in Nebraska. And this tooth was forwarded on to Osborne. He was the paleontologist of the day. And after studying it for a few years in 1922, Osborne declared it to be Hesperopithecus Harold Cookai, or ape of the Western world. 
declared him to be a primitive species of anthropoid ape. Now, from that tooth. Now, that's, see, the imagination you have to have as a paleontologist. And in a few days, the British newspapers published this. This is Mr. and Mrs. Hesperopithecus. <laughs> and the complete lifestyle, the uh, culture, everything about him. And um, actually, the, the drawing that was featured in the paper of, of this guy was modeled after Java Man. And, uh, but you know what his nickname was? This Asparopithecus? Nebraska Man. Does that ring a bell? One of the biggest pieces of fraud ever foisted on American public. <laughs> and uh, the tooth turned, ended up being the tooth of an extinct pig. Osborne also uh, recruited this gentleman, Roy Chapman Andrews. He was one of my heroes as a kid. I read everything I could by Roy Chapman Andrews, who was a real explorer. And in fact, uh, many think that Indiana Jones was, was, the, uh, was modeled after Roy Chapman Andrews. You can kind of see the, you know, the, the campaign hat and the pistol. He always had a pistol strapped to his side. And uh, it was quite an adventure. He was all over the world. Anyway, Osborne sent him to China to find fossil evidence for the origin of man. And that's why he went over there in the 1920s. He was the first one to actually use the automobile in fossil hunting. Now, you see, in Marshes and Cope's day, they used the wagons and the train. But now, here he is. These, they're Dodge their dodges is what they are. And so he would take the crew in to the Gobi Desert in these things. And then the pack mules would come later with all the supplies. Uh, he was the one who discovered the first dinosaur eggs ever discovered in China, in the Gobi Desert, 1920s. He's quite a dinosaur hunter. And uh, so it, this, I read everything I could. I still have one of his books. Oh, actually, I have several of his books still. This one here had a real profound effect on me, all about dinosaurs. And it's really not all about dinosaurs, kids. It's, it's really more about his adventures in China. And uh, it's a wonderful book, but it uh, had a tremendous effect on me. And, of course, this was at the time when I grew up near the Bighorn River in Montana. This is where I did a lot of my fossil hunting stomping uh, through the Bighorn River area and looking for bones and, and uh, all kinds of fossils and agates. And it was a wonderful life. Uh, one of the things that's not known about Roy Chapman Andrews, though, this has gotten buried, is that while he was in China, he found this skull of Paraceratherium. It's actually a giant rhinoceros. You want to see how big he was? That's how big he was. And here's the thing, he found it in dinosaur rock layers. And he shipped it back. The picture I showed you, the former picture there, was uh, uh, from 1932. It got buried in the basement of the American Museum of Natural History. They didn't know, quite know what to do with it. And uh, so today, when you, if somebody tells you, how come you never find mammal fossils with dinosaurs? You do. They just, got, they just get buried all the time, and some of them, they, they get thrown away. There are paleontologists that will freely admit the big money is in the dinosaur bones. No one's interested in mammal fossils. If they find mammal fossils, they just throw them away. There are paleontologists who want to give away blocks of sediment that are filled with mammal fossils that came out of their dinosaur digs. They want somebody to take them and study them, but there's, there's no money in it. And so the stuff gets ignored. One of the other students of Osborne was this guy here, Barnum Brown. He's called the King of Collectors. And that picture on the lower left there shows him on the left and then Osborne on the right. They're out in the field in Montana. 1902, they discovered the first remains of T-Rex. Now look at the book there. Barnum's bones, it's called, that shows a T-Rex skull. Well, how many bones did he find? 34. <laughs> and this was the T-Rex, and um, it was different. Of course, the fossils were much different, but only 34 bones were found. When I first heard of his discovery, I thought, wow, there was the first complete T-Rex found in 1902. 
No, there's 34 bones that were found. And uh, so Barnum Brown also, he, was a part, he graduated from my alma mater. He graduated from the University of Kansas uh, quite a while ago, long before I was there. But he was from my alma mater. Uh, another one of Cope's disciples. Now, I, here's what I want you to see with this. The influence of these guys on other men who came after them have influenced us. And that's what we've got to see here. Here's another collector named Charles Sternberg. Are any of you from Kansas at all? Yeah, I'm from Kansas. Well, if you, okay, well, if you go through Kansas and you get to Hayes, Kansas, on Gunsmoke, it was the town where they hung all the bad guys. It was in Hayes. But Hayes has the Sternberg Museum. And it has a lot of his discoveries still in the Sternberg Museum. The whole family was involved in it, and they found some amazing fossils. The, the duck-billed dinosaur mummy came from the Sternbergs, and the fish within a fish, showing him eating this thing, that came from the Sternbergs. I have these two books here, The Life of a Fossil Hunter and Hunting Dinosaurs in the Badlands. He and Cope were very, very good friends. When Cope died, Sternberg was still digging up dinosaurs for him out in, um, I believe he was in New Mexico at the time. And, uh, but he had a very, very close friendship. But these are the guys that really built American paleontology. And uh, there have been a lot of changes. When you go back through and notice the species that they, these guys so-called named and they uh, tried to illustrate and so on, you saw 75% of them are no longer valid. That's because a new crop of paleontologists has arisen. They've been affected by them, but they're new, and they got their own ideas. And now your kids are growing up with different ideas. Birds, dinosaurs with feathers and hair. My goodness. None of that stuff existed when I was a kid. Birds were birds. Dinosaurs were dinosaurs. And uh, it's really having a, a very big impact on all the programs the kids watch, the books they get at the library. They have got to learn some of this stuff and know how to interpret and recognize the frauds that are going on. This is a big job for us as parents and grandparents. All my kids are growing now. I preach to them, and now it's my grandkids, you see. Now I get to take them on little field trips and get to run them through my garage and show them things and stuff like that. But they have got, we have got to do this with our kids. doesn't need to be complicated, but we have got to take some steps to equip these kids in the next generation. Um, they're just, they're headed for some major, major assault. We never faced this, even when I was in college. When I used to, when I became a believer at the University of Kansas, and I would I would do open air preaching on creation evolution stuff outside. Nobody quite knew what to do with it. You know, professors would just say, just let him alone. He's like a gnat, you know, he'll disappear one of these days. But we never did. And so they got on the, they got in the show by writing books and kids' books. The kids' books out there, they are writing from an evolutionary standpoint. I've got a lot of them. I've got several hundred of these books on my shelf are incredibly well illustrated, and they're getting their points across. They're evangelizing our kids, and we're sitting kind of back saying, you know, we're, we're not sure whether we want to talk about this stuff. It, it um, you know, it's a, it can be a real problem. But uh, although paleontology gives the impression that it is a science free from the emotions and petty squabbles of lesser men and women, many frauds and damaged reputations have come out of paleontology and the quest for fame and fortune, and that's really what it's all about. American paleontology is a child of fallen human nature. We must not forget that. And uh, it's really up to us to um, learn some of this stuff. We don't need to become geniuses at it. We just need to learn some basic things. We need to know our history. We need to know our biblical history. We have got to know this stuff better because it's being assaulted like at no other time in history. Okay, so um, I am done. 
I told uh, uh, Heinz here, if I couldn't see the clock, it, all bets were off, and I can't. I can't see it. So I don't know where we are. <laughs> but I, yeah, you've got some questions. If we have time, I'd be glad to address them. Okay, let's uh, thank Patrick for his presentation. He dumped a lot of information on us, and I'm sure most of us have never heard about some of these wars and all the facts of the dinosaur fossils, but we'll take some time for Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, put up your hand, and I'll bring the microphone around, and uh, we will have the men come by in, in a few minutes. I remember what, how we support this ministry is through free will uh, donations. So, uh, and they are tax uh, deductible too, if you if you care. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, one of the questions I had though is is that uh, you said that the Brontosaurus was a fraud, uh, and there were pieces that were attached that weren't part of it. Yeah. Uh, but the original bones, the basically the. Uh, the basic skeleton, uh, what were they? Was, was that another dinosaur? Or? Well, they think you know, the dinosaurs recently in paleontology in the last 20, 25 years or so, they've begun to open up to the idea that dinosaurs actually grew. And so they started out as a, as a, as a child and they grew. And that a lot of the differences in sizes are related to maturity levels. And so some think that perhaps the, these bones that they shipped back were maybe just a young, another dinosaur that was named earlier called a patasaurus. Uh, incidentally, a patasaurus means deceptive lizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and again, if you have a question, hold up your hand and I'll bring the mic around. Thank him for one of my questions. Um, if I could, I don't want to steal anybody else's questions, but two. One, who were the commentators of the 1800s that you mentioned that went away from a biblical point of view, worldview, to an evolutionary? Because um, I read a lot of commentators, and I know some of them are like from the 1800s. Yeah. And then two, you've made a couple of comments. Early on, you talked about a bone, and I think you may have said it was a T Rex bone or a. Or a some other name, and then you made the comment that um, it was a mammal bone. How do you know that's true? And are you making any assumptions? Um, I mean, how do you know something is a mammal bone versus a reptile bone? Well, that's a good question. In some cases, you can't tell. In fact, what I've been doing a lot here lately is because of the, I was taught the geologic timetable just indoctrinated in it, then you're taught if you, if you find fossils in this particular layer, those are mammal fossils, period. And they came much, much, much later than dinosaurs. But as I looked at that more and more, I said, well, wait a minute, no. These are, they, they, they didn't come later. Most of these existed at the same time. So you could have fossils from flood and pre-flood, and you could have fossils from post-flood. Sorting out the differences and where they belong is really a major challenge. And uh, the only reason why the paleontologists seem to have it down is because they've got it split up into these times and these ecological um, uh, uh, sections and so on. But the, the, the bones, um, <clears throat> your first question again, your, the first question you asked, yeah, commentators. Yeah, some of these guys were not evolutionists. Where they compromised was the literal view of Genesis. One of those uh, is Hodge, uh, Charles Hodge, famous commentator in the 1800s. Uh, Westcott, Strong, um, Charles Spurgeon. Um, also, the guy who gave us the Schofield Bible, Schofield. Uh, and, you know, the, this idea of the day age where a day can equal distant past and so on. They didn't know what to do with what was happening. Um, paleontology was growing by leaps and bounds, and the church just was not keeping up with the challenge. I think we're, we're making the same mistake today. 
and uh, we don't keep up with it. We just say, hey, it's not an important issue. You know, people are saved by the gospel. Yeah, that's true, but people are prepared to believe the gospel by the reality of the scripture. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So I, <clears throat> I think they're just, and the list goes on. The only commentary I have found that actually ascribes the meaning um, in Job where it talks about behemoth, for instance. Most commentators just deal with that as well. You know, we kind of have to admit here, Job really wasn't, didn't know what he was talking about. But uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown actually called the critter a dinosaur. That's been the only one I have found. Okay, so, another question back here. About okay, here. yeah. In your experience, have you ever come across human bones with dinosaur bones? I haven't, no. Um, of course, <laughs> there are some things that I've discovered later. I go, whoa, that is a surprise to me, you know, than when I thought it was something when it was totally different. Um, but there have been people, there have been paleontologists uh, who, who have found things where they shouldn't be. I've got a book I'm working on now. It's kind of my definitive book on dinosaurs. And I hope to have it done this next year. But in it, I mention a uh, hundred fossils that were discovered in the years past, some of them in the 1800s, that are markers for evolutionists. They call them index fossils. They mark a particular time period. And that's what marks it. And they, they qualify because at the time they were discovered, there was nothing, uh, there was nothing above them. They just, they seem to end. And so that was their time of existence. Uh, but there are over 100 fossils so far that I've been able to document that since their discovery and labeling as index fossils have been found above and below. So either it pushes evolution back or it stretches different periods and processes within evolution out into the future. And evolutionists know this. But uh, so one way to deal with it is just simply take them off the roll as an index fossil. But there are over 100 of these, and those will all be listed in this book. Okay, another question back here. Yeah. Have you been able to correlate the different bone beds these uh, researchers across the United States have discovered with the same sedimentary uh, strata? Ha have I been able to correlate them? Yeah, are they found in the same strata? Well, here's the problem. <clears throat> Some of them they are, yes. But here, now here's the problem. When geologists began studying Western, especially Western geology of America, <clears throat> a lot of them were doing it independently of others. And they would name the formations. And so the formation would get its name, they get described. And then another guy would do another... Uh, study and it was it was the exact same formation but given a different name. So uh, one example of this is the um, Hell Creek Formation, which is a part of a much bigger formation called the Morrison Formation. But at the time the Morrison was labeled, it was in Colorado and Wyoming, and the Hell Creek was in Montana and in southern Canada. So, but now on a bigger geological map, they stretch all the way from Mexico all the way to Greenland. So those are huge sedimentary beds, and they indicate a much more catastrophic origin and explanation than just simply isolated formations. That's been part of the big problem. Okay, one last question. Let me ask the question. Uh, you, you've, you, uh, you know about a lot of the, uh, f the dinosaur fossil graveyards. There are some huge ones around the world. Yeah. And uh, what w would you say is the most complete skeleton that they have found amongst all those graveyards? Well, I've never because cataloged Because all, all these, many of these examples, you just, you know, a few bones are put together. Well, probably the biggest one is out of Ghost Ranch. When Cope started digging there, he discovered and named a dinosaur, a small dinosaur called Coelophysis, meant hollow form, just a small, small little dinosaur. And another guy who went back to part of the American Museum of Natural History, another one of Osborne's disciples, 
named Edwin Colbert. He was also a very big influence in my life as a kid. His book on dinosaurs is really quite good. It's just called Dinosaurs. And it's very, very good. He went back into the ghost ranch and he discovered a graveyard of over 40 coelophyses is all buried together. And so that's one of the most complete. Another one in, see, southern North Dakota, southwestern corner of North Dakota, uh, they found a huge bed of 20 or 30 triceratops that were all buried together. And that hit the news here several years ago. Um, Dinosaur National Monument has, uh, although most of those bones are disarticulated, they have pulled a lot of, they put the bones together from a, uh, forming a lot of complete dinosaurs out of there. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Let's give Patrick a hand. Okay, just to uh, wrap things up here, as uh, I said, we have Dr. Sarfetti coming here in February. He'll be speaking here on the 22nd, Friday the 22nd, on this topic of bioethics, which covers life, death, morality, and a bunch of related issues. Very general kind of uh, discuss of bioethics. And uh, you can see some of the points that he would plan to uh, present here. And you see, he will show that uh, what people conclude is based on, you know, th clear thinking of what they read in Genesis and uh, what they're told by some of the secular um, geologists and other scientists. So we look forward to having him here that uh, Friday, the 22nd. As as I mentioned, he will be here from the in this area from the 20th, which is a Wednesday through to Sunday, and he'll be speaking at nine different uh, venues. Um, I'm not going to go through all those here, of course, but there is a flyer on the back table which has a list of, of uh, all of the events that he'll be going to. You just pick up one of these, or of course go to the website, and this is available on the website as well. And I particularly want to mention the, on Saturday he will be at the Mount Vernon Emmanuel Baptist Church, which is a fairly large church, and uh, we are going to have uh, two things, as I mentioned, the, the mini-conference, where he'll be speaking on the topic of God, the master designer, and what evidence we have for that. That's in the morning, two lectures, and uh, we'll have a, a lot of Q&A at the end of that, and then there'll be a lunch hour, and then at one o'clock, uh, he's going to do a chess challenge. And uh, like I said, he can handle up to 30 different players all at the same time, just walking from one board to another. So if you want to either participate in that or just come to watch, you're welcome to do that as well. And so that's on the Saturday the 23rd. And uh, again, at the back, you'll see a flyer which explains that in more detail. And uh, if you go to the website, the Apologetics Forum website, apologeticsforum.org, as you see at the bottom, you'll see at the very top, there's a, a menu item called chess. Click on that, and uh, you'll find all the details. And if you want to participate, uh, you, you're gonna have to, you should register on that website. Just simple registration, fill in the information, and that's it, okay? So, uh, and there's a lot of flyers on the back table. Take a look at those, pick up those that you want, but, but all the information is always on the website as well. So let me just close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this time again and we just thank you for uh, Patrick's ministry and all the information that he um, gave to us, which uh, of course uh, uh, refutes some of the directions that the secular geologists have taken us in. And Lord, we just pray that we would not be uh, misled by all of those uh, attempts to do that. And we thank you for the record we have in your word, in particular the first 11 chapters of Genesis and the evidence that you have uh, left for us as the truth for, the, for your word. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.